Welcome everybody to uh, Building Privacy Compliance on AWS. My name is Carl Mathis. I'm a senior privacy architect with uh, AWS Security Assurance Services, a wholly owned subsidiary of AWS. And with me, I have Dan Neeters. Dan? Hi, Daniel Neeters. I am a senior privacy architect with AWS Security Assurance Services. Like Carl said, we're a wholly owned subsidiary uh, within AWS, uh, more specifically within AWS Professional Services. Thanks, Dan. So first, the obligatory legal disclaimer. We are not uh, attorneys. We don't play attorneys at AWS. We don't play attorneys on TV. Uh, what we are are privacy architects who are going to show you some tried and true patterns about how you can enable privacy compliance uh, in your AWS environment. Now, what we're gonna, what we're gonna walk through today is not, does not certify you for privacy, but lays the foundation for privacy enablement. So for our agenda, we're going to talk about what you as an organization, what you face in the current privacy environment. We're going to talk about a little bit about the shared responsibility model. In order to understand how we view privacy and how we can help you with privacy, you really need to get a thorough understanding of the shared responsibility model. We're going to talk about the differences between privacy and security because we are going to be zeroing in on privacy not security. We will be talking about security technologies, but we're going to be focusing on tangible privacy outcomes. We're going to look at our services and features, how they support privacy. We'll talk about the fact that all of our services are GDPR eligible, for example, but then really what does that mean for you as an organization? We'll talk about, whoops, we'll talk about some resources that you can go to uh, that when you get this slide deck later on, that you can actually click on these hyperlinks and they'll take you to some of the most popular uh, resources that we have included an updated data privacy center. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Dan and we're going to, and he's gonna take you through some privacy uh, architectures of how to address certain customer challenges. All right, thanks Carl. I'll be thanks, back Dan. in a little bit. Okay, so you as an organization, what do you face in the current privacy environment, right? where you have evolving privacy regulations. New regulations are coming online every time you turn around, right? In 2023, we have Colorado coming online. We have Virginia, we have Utah, Connecticut, Massachusetts, just passed new laws, right? This past year, you had CPRA, which was uh, went into effect to help CCPA in California, right? You have the European Union, right? They are continually modifying, you have new guidance from the European Data Protection Board, right? You also have varying requirements based on vertical that you're in, whether it's healthcare, whether it's IOT, they all have differing re requirements. And if you wanna go global expansion, right? You can start here in the US, but then you have to take, when you, when you go to Canada, not only do you have to deal with the federal laws in Canada, the Privacy Act, PAPIDA, but you also have all the provincial laws you have to deal with as well. Then you go to Europe, you have GDPR, but then you have all the nation state laws, Asia PAC, uh, Latin America, they're all the same, okay? But they're all a little bit different. Now, we talked about the, how, that, how these privacy laws are changing and the threat landscape is changing as well, okay? Now, what do I mean by that? What do I mean by that is the fact that you need to start thinking about if, you, if a piece of data becomes exposed, right, either in single or in aggregate, what is the risk to your data subject, right? So in other words, what is the taxonomy or the category of harms that you need to mitigate against, okay? You can't just say, well, I need to protect against privacy. What is privacy? You have to start breaking that down into its constituent parts, right? Some of the dimensions. Some key dimensions of privacy are linkability and identifiability. Right, and we're gonna talk a little bit about those later. And then as you know, with every privacy and security regulation, there are stringent reporting and documentation re requirements, right? The old, the uh, current joke is, if you don't document it and have a log for it, it didn't happen, right? So everything that you do to a piece of personal information, you need to have some kind of documentation or, or, or log for it. And then do you have the knowledge in-house for AWS services and features to enable the support for privacy, right? 
So in other words, you have to train, you, not only do you have to train your people on privacy, privacy awareness and training, but you also have to train them on the technology to support privacy. Now, privacy consists of three different aspects, people, process, and technology. And they all have to be reflective of each other, right? You can have all the privacy engineering in the world, but if you're not hanging it on uh, uh, privacy policies, right, for enforcement, what good is it? So you need to have both the people, the process, and the technology side. Now, the shared responsibility model. This is fundamental to understanding how AWS operates, okay? Because remember, one of the foundations of the shared responsibility model is that you as a data controller are ultimately responsible for your data, okay? We act as a processor for you. Now, this is the traditional model of privacy and security. You guys own the full stack, right? from your customer data up at the top, all the way down to the hardware at the bottom, okay? You take care of everything. So you are covering it from end to end. What happens when you start to partner with AWS is there's a security of the cloud and there's a security in the cloud. Security of the cloud is what we provide you. So we have AWS artifacts, right? You can go into AWS artifacts, you can download all of our SOC 2, all of our 20, uh, 29,017 or 27,017, 27,018, 27,701, which is the ISO privacy standard. We have all the attestations for that. So think of from the hypervisor level on down, we take care of. So we take care of the regions. We take care of the availability zones, all of our data centers, right? We take care of our, all, all of our points of presence, like for a cloud front. Now, once you put your data into the cloud, that's security in the cloud, and that's what you bring to the table, right? So it's how you configure all of our services. It's what security tools you bring to the table. Maybe you're a big checkpoint or Palo Alto shop, so you bring those firewalls in, right? It's the processes that you bring in, such as an approval process for gaining identity and uh, for uh, access management, right? It's also the IDP, or the identity store that you bring to the table, right? Are you using AW, Are you using uh, Azure AD? Are you using some other, like in my day, uh, 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 NetWare, right? If people remember eDirectory, right? Showing my age there, okay? But that all is what you bring into the table. Now, we can map this out and we can say, okay, everything from the bottom Hypervisor on down, including our foundational services, compute, storage, databases, networking, okay? And our global AWS infrastructure, regions, availability zones, and edge locations. And all of these, AWS endpoints, we are a cloud. So how do you get to us? You have to come over the internet at some point and you touch our AWS endpoints. Well, guess what? Our AWS endpoints can take HTTP or HTTPS. So when, you, so when we talk about configuring for privacy, one of the obvious things you should do is you should configure our AWS endpoints for HTTPS and disable HTTP traffic. By just enabling HTTPS doesn't disable HTTP, okay? So it's simple things like that. And then uh, this is all security of the cloud and then security in the cloud. Right, so all of the encryption parameters, right? So client-side encryption, server-side encryption, then we have the operating system, network and firewall configurations. And what do we mean by operating system? So when you create an EC2 instance, you're responsible for patching it, not us, okay? So that means that you have to go in and make sure that your software is current. We aren't going to do that for you, okay? your platform and application management. Make sure that the libraries that your, app, that your developers are using are current, right? That they're not legacy frameworks that have a whole bunch of security and privacy. Now we can help you with that and we can help you orchestrate that, but the ultimate responsibility falls back on you. Now, on the far right, we have AWS IAM. We also have the customer IAM. We do not want you to recreate all of your users in 
A-W-S-I-A-M. We want you to federate. We want you to use roles. We want you, we want to leverage all the hard and good work that you've done setting up your groups and memberships and processes in your IDP, in your active directory. We want to leverage that through AWSSO. Okay. Now, as you all know, we do role-based access control, but we introduced something last year, which is great for privacy. It's ABAC. It's attribute-based access control. It gives you much granular access and it reduces the number of policies that you have to have and roles because now you can be selective. You can have the same policy handle an attribute that has a, uh, a red condition and a, or another attribute that has a green condition, right? And you can get very, very granular. And guess what we just announced? We just announced that AD, uh, ABAC is now fully uh, embedded with Lambda. So now you can use ABAC with Lambda, which is even better. We are slowly adding this to all of our services. Now, when you come into AWS, it's not just you, right? You're coming into partnership with us. So you bring your security tools, you inherit our security tools. Remember that AWS is built to the most rigid standards of our highest value customers. So in other words, financial services who work with the federal government or any international government, they have very high standards. We build to that, okay? You inherit all of that by default. Now, you also bring in your own SaaS providers, okay? So you may be a checkpoint shop. You may bring a software as an application in. So all of these third parties, we are working together. Now, here's an example, Splunk. A lot of people use Splunk for logging. Well, guess what? Splunk resides on AWS, Splunk Cloud resides on AWS and they accept private link. So you can create a private link connection, which is a secure private tunnel between your AWS environment and the Splunk Cloud environment. That is a privacy enhancing pattern, okay? Now, you can see here that we have multiple classes of services, three broad categories, infrastructure services. Well, what's an infrastructure service? That's EC2, that's a VPC, right? That's tr traditionally what you think of as infrastructure as a service. We have container services. Now by container, I don't mean Docker. I don't mean Kubernetes. What I mean is where data is, in, is, is, is containerized within a service. So we're talking about Elastic Beanstalk. We're talking about RDS. You don't maintain the platform, but you have control of the platform. We update it or we provide the updates. You choose when to apply those updates. You create the database tables in RDS. You determine who has access to it. And third, we had abstract services. I don't want to bust any bubbles, but S3 buckets are not really buckets stationed around the globe. That's actually a underlying uh, network storage system, right? Tremendous but it's an abstract service, right? Because you can't go in and mess around with the actual service itself. But what you can do is configure who has access to the service and how you can secure your data in the service. Same thing with DynamoDB, okay? DynamoDB is considered an abstract service. Lambda, Lambda is an abstract service because it's serverless, right? You can look at Fargate. So we have several of those. And as you use more of our abstract services, we take over more of the responsibility, okay? Now, you notice that our role goes up when you go to the right. So when you're talking about platform as a service, we take over more, but you still have control. Even when we're talking about software as a service, S3, you still maintain the control over the data and the protection of the data. We will never ever take responsibility for your data, which means we will never move your data outside of region, right? You determine where it goes, how long it stays there, when you delete it, et cetera, all right? Now, we're gonna show you a new slide that you may or may not have seen before. And we're gonna rephrase this in terms of customizability, customizability versus customer responsibility. So with our infrastructure services, and you can call this infrastructure as a service, 
you have the most customizability, but the most responsibility, okay? Now, just because the responsibility sh shifts, who is still accountable? You are, as a controller, you still maintain that accountability. Now, as we go to platform as a service, right, or containers, container services, you have, uh, you give up more of the responsibility, but you still have a fair amount of flexibility. And then when you go all the way over to abstract services, right, then you give up a lot of your uh, responsibility. You have a lot less customizability, but because you're relying on us, you are now inheriting all of our security and privacy best practices, right? So in other words, you don't have to remember uh, we put private link on the back end. We secure the inter-service communications, right? So we have all that stuff for you done on the back end, okay? You do, you're not left up to say, hey, I gotta make sure that security, uh, that my uh, transport mechanisms are secure, right? That encryption is enabled because we do that for you. Now, again, we will go up to, and we will go up to customer data. Okay, but we're not going to take over and do anything with your customer data. So if you encrypt your customer data, you have to make that choice. Now, security and privacy. Is security sufficient for privacy? The answer is no. Security is a necessary but not sufficient condition for privacy. Now, there are three myths about, three myths about privacy. Privacy is security, okay? You can be secure, but still not be private. Privacy is control. What that means is just because you give control to a data subject, you can do anything you want with their data. That's not true either, okay? Because there's things such as anti-patterns. Who's actually gone to a website, got, gotten a, a consent notice or a privacy notice, and at the bottom, it's, you read it, at the bottom it says, I agree and continue, and they both do the same thing? Okay, you're giving the customer control, but you're not giving them any choice. Okay, that doesn't, that's, that doesn't mean that, that now you can do anything you want with the data. And third, privacy is consent notice choice. Privacy is more than just consent notice choice. Because what about choice? Choice has to be willful, has to be informed. Okay, there are a lot of uh, privacy anti-patterns like infinite accounts. Okay, let's say that you want to uh, get a Gartner report and then you go in and you sign up. And what do they want? They want your first and last name. They want the business you work for. They want your telephone number. Well, you know what I do? I actually have a pre-written e email that I send back to the company that says, look, you're, you're taking more data than you need from me because all you're gonna do is send me an email with a link on it, right? So here's my email. If you don't send me the report, I'm gonna report you to the FTC. And guess what? I've gotten every Gartner report I've ever wanted, okay? Because they know that they're doing something wrong. All right, so what's the difference between privacy and security? Well, privacy and security, they're related and they overlap, but they have different tangible outcomes, okay? So confidentiality, integrity, and availability, right? That's traditional security. However, there's different tangible outcomes when it comes to privacy. Linkability, consent, notice, choice. You could go on, okay? And then there's this middle area where they overlap with each other, right? Use, access, disclosure, identifiability. Well, people say, okay, well, what do you mean, Carl, when you say linkability versus identifiability? Identifiability is, the, is, is when you can take an attribute, you can take somebody's car, you can take their clothes, and you can uh, attribute it directly to a known individual, okay? Now, my birthday, my birthday and the kind of car I drive, you could attribute to me, right? It singles me out. Now, you could also take the car that I drive and that is linkable to me, but you don't know that it's me, okay? So think of it like a pseudonym, for example. 
you know that, that I own one of seven cars in the city that I live of this make and model. You don't know that I'm specifically that person, but you can link it back to me, okay? And that's the difference. And so when, when, when Dan gets up here later and he talks about ways that you can mitigate privacy, what we're doing is we're targeting these constituent uh, components. We're targeting linkability. We're targeting identifiability. And there's, there's, there's people who even say there's a third category called addressability, okay? Now, I wanna say one statement about personal information versus PII, personally identifiable information. PII is, for the most part, a US-centric term, right? PII, when people say PII, what they think about is, oh, that's those 18 data elements that are part of HIPAA, right? which according to the safe harbor standard, if you remove all those, the data is anonymized. The rest of the world thinks something completely different. The rest of the world says, well, hold on, hold on. It's not personally identifiable information. That's a sense, they say subcategory of personal information, which is more sensitive, but the bigger category is personal information, which is any piece of data, which is identifiable, identified, link or linkable to a natural person. And what does that say? Well, that says that almost any piece of information about somebody has the potential to be personal information, right? And that's where you have to start thinking about privacy risk threat modeling and things like that to quantify what identifiability and linkability mean. Services and features. Now, this is gonna be one of my favorite, favorite slides, right? Which is we have category, we've categorized our our services into these uh, terms like data minimization, where we minimize the data exposure, data-centric design, intentionally putting data at the center of your design process, disclosure control, you know, that's more or less aligned with security, continuous oversight, individual autonomy. Individual autonomy, we're talking about machine learning, uh, involving the data subject into decisions, so we're gonna kind of highlight a couple of data, data minimization. Well, what we mean by data minimization at the forefront is creating a data map, classifying and understanding your data. Well, we have several tools for that. We have Amazon Macy, we have Amazon Comprehend, okay? Now, <clears throat> you can use those tools, you can use, use third-party partners like Privatar, but you can't make good privacy architectural decisions until you know your data, okay? If you don't know your data, how can you make a decision? Data-centric design. I'm gonna tell you the ones that I am very high on. If you're not using private link right now, you should be. If you're not using VPC endpoints, you should be. Anywhere you can use VPC endpoints, you should be. And that's almost any service in AWS, okay? That is a secure tunnel at layer five, okay? Control tower. Control Tower is the best way that you can automate compliance within the privacy space. We have SCPs, which are considered mandatory, recommended, and they deal with things like allowing data to move from one region to another, cross-border data transfers, okay? They, you know, they can limit who, who has the ability to spin up a service in a given region, okay? Then we have disclosure control, IAM, attribute based access control. That's your biggest weapon that you have for that. Now, we also recommend Amazon Code Guru. Now, when I say Amazon Code Guru, people look at me and say, I don't need some code review program to tell me that my syntax is off, right? That's why I have a smart IDE. Well, if you think that, that that's all that Code Guru does, you need to read some more. Code Guru actually looks for code that can lead to privacy leakage and then recommends a fix for it. It has over 20 privacy, uh, pri uh, information leakage detection algorithms built into it already, and they're adding more all the time, okay? So Code Guru is something that you should definitely look at, an IEM access analyzer, right? When they redid Macy, they took some of the user behavior analytics uh, anomaly capability, and where'd they put it? They put it in IEM Access Analyzer. And IEM Access Analyzer can detect if you're having anonymous traffic around your S3 buckets, 
right? If you have spikes and access to your S3 buckets at 3 a.m., you probably have something going on that you need to investigate. Continuous oversight. Well, these are all of your cloud trail logs or all of your logging sources, right? And the one we're gonna talk about is going to be AWS Audit Manager. Audit Manager is a new capability that we unveiled last year that we are building up to be able to provide and gather attestation for you to give to your regulators, okay? So that you can say, we're adding GDPR to it, we're adding PCI to it. So we'll go through and add and collect all that attestation for you. And individual autonomy, okay? Now for individual autonomy, the key one that you're gonna to wanna to look at is AWS Lambda. AWS Lambda is gonna be critical when it comes to orchestrating privacy at scale, which if you're gonna be global, you have to do. You can't continue to maintain a manual process. You have to be able to automate. Another good tool is Amazon DynamoDB. Does it for two reasons. One, it's incredibly fast and with a lot of privacy mechanisms, you don't have to have a transactional database. What you need is a NoSQL database. And you need a NoSQL database, which is global and fast, hence you have DynamoDB. Now, what can you also do? You can set the TTLs low in DynamoDB so that the data is there, TTL expires, it's not. What's the best way not to have any kind of incident? It's not to have the data in the first place, right? So if you can get rid of the data, after it's used for the service or for the transaction, do so. That's one of the fundamental principles of data minimization. Now, we're gonna talk a little bit about resources. AWS Artifact, when a regulator comes to you and says, hey, can you give me information about your SOC 2 compliance or your 27,818, you can say, yes, I can. Let me go to AWS Artifacts, pull that down, and then I can send that to you, okay? That's what AWS Artifacts is for. We have a continual line of regulators and auditors going through our data centers all the time. We are now ISO 27701 certified. We are 27001-002, okay? So every time they throw out a new certification, we're there. When they come, right now there's no official certification for privacy. There's some stuff coming out of Singapore uh, for processor and controller, but that hasn't met, that's not global yet. So when, so when somebody comes up and says, hey, I can, you know, I, can, I, I can see if you're compliant with GDPR, compliant to what? There is no standard for compliance to GDPR, right? It's best, it's best guess, so refer to your uh, legal counsel. Right, but when they come out with that, guess who's gonna go and get that certification? It's gonna be AWS, you'll be able to download it from Artifact. CISB, CISB is the European organization that, that uh, manage or monitors infrastructure as a service companies that do business in Europe. So we're talking about us, we're talking about our competitors, right? Last year, they released their code of conduct, right? And what that code of conduct means is that you can get certified against that code of conduct. We have 52 services which are currently declared to be compliant. Well, why is that important? Because the European Data Protection Board has said that the CISP certification, the CISP code of conduct supports GDPR articles 40 and 41. That's important, okay? So anything that you can get to support that, you should. So you should, and you can go to the CISP website and you can download, you can go and look at AWS or Amazon and it will show you what services are certified. It will also show you what service sites are in the process of being certified, right? We have well over 200 services and are we gonna get to all of them? Yes, we are, right? But we have to continue to innovate in the process, okay? Our ISO certifications, the big ones that you need to be aware of are these last three, right? 27701, 270117, and 27118. Now, they are, they are, ISO is rapidly coming out with the identification standards. They're coming out with anonymization standards. So does those appear too, 
right? We'll start to take those into account and develop services for those, right? So we have, uh, you have uh, ISO, the whole 31,000 series is really gonna be privacy focused. You have ISO 20, uh, 30,000, you have ISO 29,100, right? You have ISO 27,500, 27, right? Those are all under development and are gonna be really focused on this idea of protecting personal information. Now, these are all hyperlinks, right? So when you get this, you'll be able to go into presentation or if it's in PDF, just click on them and they'll take you, take you right there. So we have a data privacy center. It's brand new and updated, okay? Has a lot of privacy information. I highly encourage that be your first stop for anything privacy on AWS. We also have a privacy features page of AWS services. And what this does is this privacy services features page talks about privacy features of AWS services. Do they encrypt? Do they encrypt by default? Okay. Do they inherently transfer data? If you've ever used recognition or image software, Recognition is only located in US East 1. So if you use recognition, you can upload the data in your current region, but to process that data, it's got to move to US East 1. But what could that be considered? A cross-border data transfer, right? You would have to check with your legal counsel to make sure, but you know it does cross jurisdiction, okay? And then the last, this is, <clears throat> this is a white paper. How does AWS help EU customers navigate the new normal for, for data protection. Now you notice that we spend a lot of time talking about the EU. And we do that because uh, GDPR has become the de facto standard, right? All the new legislation here, West Virginia, Colorado, they are closely patterning EU and the European Data Protection Board uh, is the leader in giving uh, specific guidance for privacy, right? So you can take a lot of what, that, what they offer and you can see if that works to other jurisdictions such as Canada, such as Asia. Asia's, Asia Pack is a little bit different in, in the respect that China is there, right? But, you know, Singapore, South Korea, Japan, you know, they have regul regulations which are, which are comparable. Now I'm going to here, turn it over to Dan, and Dan is going to talk about specific customer challenges and architectures. Now, I just want to point out that this has been a 100, this is a 101. This is a basic, uh, basic course. If you would like to get more information, please reach out to us and we can have deeper conversations. Thank you for your time and I hope you had a great conference at Reinforce. Thanks, Carl. So yeah, I mean, uh, I had mentioned at the beginning of our talk, you know, uh, Carl and I are part of AWS Security Assurance Services, uh, more specifically uh, within um, AWS Professional Services. So. You know, we spend all day, every day, talking to small uh, small startups, ISVs, uh, large enterprise customers, and so this will be like Carl said. This is our 101. Um, this is a small, like a, a smattering of these different uh, patterns that we've seen implemented that we recommend to customers, um, and these are all aligned with those five engineering principles Carl was sharing around data minimization, data centric design, uh, et cetera. So starting off, uh, just to kick that off, is data minimization. And this, you know, if you're familiar with our security epics, right? IAM, detective controls, infrastructure security. IAM is really the foundation of security. From a privacy perspective, we really consider data minimization to be that foundation. Um, that's where we start. That's where I start every conversation with customers. It's do you have a data map? Do you have a chief privacy officer? Have you defined the data that you need for delivery of the service? And are you restricting any data outside of that definition, right? So these are a couple of those capabilities, right? And you also have to think about it in terms of the data life cycle. So you've got, what are you restricting on the front end before the data even enters your environment? And there's not enough emphasis being put on that in my opinion. Um, and then of course, once you've you know, brought that data into your environment, as we'll go through here, how are you transforming that data to reduce the risk of holding onto that data during the li entire life cycle of the data before you go and delete that data? So, you know, when we think of data transformation, we think of it in terms of pseudonymization, anonymization, masking, deletion, crypto shredding. So um, there's a lot of ways to go about that, but just a couple of architectures here. So 
one of the first ones, and I love this one um, because what I love about this architecture is that it really emphasizes transformation of the data, minimization of the data upon generation. So when we talk about data that's being consumed in, an, in, 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 a, in a customer's environment, we think of it in terms of active, kind of active and passive uh, collection of personal information, right? So active being, what is your data subject providing you in the forms that you're presenting, right? Are you giving them free form text fields? Um, are you giving them, you know, drop down boxes, uh, radio box, you know, radio buttons? So it's really important to think about, you know, limiting free form text fields, right? So we'll, we'll cover that one area around, you know, sort of active, but then there's all the passive collection, all of the logs you've enabled in your environment. Thinking about all the data of what Carl and I call data remnants. Where is PI lingering in your environment outside of your actual application data? So one area that common, you know, it's common for customers not to think about is logs, right? So in this uh, example architecture, you know, we have an application, some applications print PII data, you know, in the log output inadvertently, right? This could be due to debugging or it could be just, um, you know, like even within CloudTrail, your organization pending legal counsel might consider uh, there to be personal information within those logs. So again, there might be many reasons why this occurs, but um, you know, it's, a, it's generally a mistake to have PI and logs unless it's absolutely required and you've defined that right within your privacy policy that you need that PI in the logs to perform whatever function, whether it be operational or otherwise. So what this does is actually, um, you know, if you're generating application logs on an EC2 instance, what you can do is actually, because it's great because log4j, if you're using that to uh, generate logs, a Java library, you can use the Amazon Comprehend SDK. And what that does is, I think Carl kind of went into what Amazon Comprehend does. It pulls out, uses ML to pull out insights in text that you send it, right? So in this case, we're leveraging our uh, CloudWatch logs agent, uh, with, or sorry, we're our log4j agent to uh, basically ping out a a Amazon Pro Comprehend, sending it logs, and then using that Comprehend endpoint, that API, to find insights in those logs, and more specifically, plain text PI. So what this does is actually returns that plain text PI found in logs, redacts it, and now you can propagate those logs throughout your environment for uh, response purposes, operational purposes, right? So instead of having to re redact the PI as it exists in CloudWatch logs separately from S3, separate from your external log aggregation source like Splunk, you're, redu you're redacting that PI at the source. And really, from an engineering perspective, this is gonna make this operationally a lot easier. And so when we think about data minimization, we really focus in on at the point of ingestion, right? Whether it be active collected PI or passively collected PI. And uh, most of the architectures that I show today um, will have um, various links and we have blog posts associated with each one of these that walks you through step by step how to implement these things. So Carl got a bit into uh, consent tracking, right? So consent tracking is a common uh, pain point for our customers. So, um, you know, here we have a simple ride sharing app. Uh, I know it may look a little bit more complex than that, but uh, this uses a series of AWS services to capture initial consent and allows for uh, data subjects to update their consent, right? So as the data subject consent changes, right? Protection around their data and the minimization of that data is modified, right? So if I logged in as a user of a rideshare application and I opted in to have my uh, PI, my location data shared with a third party analytics company, right? Maybe that data is now in a somewhat redacted form shared with that third party analytics company, right? But what if I opt out at a later date, right? We need to make sure that that third party analytics company is, is notified saying, hey, this user has now opted out of us sharing your data, their data with the uh, your company for analytics purposes. Therefore, we redact it, we send them in a notification saying, hey, you have to remove all of this data out of your uh, internal data stores, right? So, you know, Carl got into how you have to have a privacy policy, the privacy notice being your front-facing version to your customers of your privacy policy. You can, it's one thing to state, state what you're doing to protect the customer data, but you have to reflect that in your engineering. And this is a great example of this. We actually presented this as a workshop to our workshop, um, contact AWS Security Assurance Services if you've 
like us to help run this for your own organization, but it gets you really hands-on in the accounts into building out some of the mechanisms for consent tracking, uh, disclosure control, and it, we kind of look at um, elements of a bad, better, best, um, you know, opt-in, opt-out uh, presented to the data subjects as well as, you know, what a bad, better, best uh, privacy notice would look like. Um, so we're not going to cover every single, um, you know, engineering principle today, uh, but, you know, for continuous oversight. So, uh, you know, CloudTrail, so without getting into the, you know, specific of CloudTrail, you know, hopefully you have CloudTrail turned on in your environments. This is some, a, a, this is like a day one, um, you know, a, a mechanism that we would, we recommend all customers to turn on to log API calls made against the um, AWS APIs. So hopefully you have this turned on, but this is a common scenario for a lot of customers, right? Where they've got many accounts in many regions and there's trails turned on in each one of those regions. So it's logging API calls in EU Central One, US East One, and maybe that's many accounts, like I said, over many, many regions. So um, a common scenario that customers don't think about is potentially if there are, is there, you know, uh, the potential of PI being contained within uh, those cloud trail logs and for some of our customers you know they may consider user agent pi right they may be considering source ip address username so you know there's a lot of when we talk about cross-border data transfers and data sovereignty requirements data residency data localization these terms are used are thrown around and used a lot but we really need to start thinking about region locking right are, are we within our legal means? Is, you know, based upon the customer's legal counsel guidance, are they within their legal means to transfer PI across region? If you're doing aggregation, right? So a common scenario is, okay, I've got logs turned on in Germany, I've got logs turned on in Latin America, and I'm centralizing all of those logs into a central S3 bucket in US East 1, right, for operational uh, purposes. So that constitutes a cross-border data transfer. Is that a problem, right? And so really it's gonna come down to deferring to the customer's legal counsel to figure out, you know, what are the nation state requirements around that transfer? You know, there are certain countries that may require redacting of elements within a log. So uh, there are tools that we can use to do that potentially, one of many options, right? So one tool that I, um, you know, I talk about often in this context is Kinesis. So, you know, you can use Kinesis and more specifically Kinesis Data Analytics for transforming uh, incoming streams of data. So I see a lot of customers, when I showed the centralized aggregation of cloud trail logs, uh, Kinesis Data Firehose is an ETL service that's commonly used to centralize uh, those logs. So again, you can use Kinesis Data Analytics as a part of this for transforming that incoming stream and create a new data stream that can be written back into the Firehose uh, before it's delivered to a destination. Um, and again, you, this supports native encryption with KMS and uh, what's great about this is then you've got a data source. This could be, you know, a uh, S3 bucket, maybe in a uh, German region, for instance. Uh, I want to transform that, but I want to send that data and centrally aggregate it into a bucket, maybe US East 1 in Virginia. I can leverage Kinesis Data Firehose transformation cap capabilities to maybe mask uh, PI elements within a single cloud trail log or many cloud trail logs. So this is just one example of that destination S3 bucket that may be our central aggregation bucket. And then maybe you need that backup somewhere. So I've included that as a part of the demonstration. Carl mentioned IM Access Analyzer. So a very common customer um, challenge is uh, second, managing secondary use of personal information uh, and third party management, right? So. Um, a big part of this is that, especially a lot of customers who open the Pandora's box of IAM and they're allowing all these folks to create uh, bucket policies, uh, IAM roles that open up access across accounts. You're gonna wanna turn on IAM Access Analyzer. Even if you haven't opened up that box, you're still gonna wanna turn on IAM, IAM Access Analyzer. You can actually create, the, turn this on in all accounts, aggregate the alerts to a central account. What IAM Access Analyzer is gonna do is allow you to define an AWS zone of trust. So these are the accounts within my zone of trust. Anything outside of that, alert me, and you know potentially even write automation to shut off that access. So it's gonna be looking for IAM roles, bucket policies, any kind of IAM policy that allows for that uh, cross-account access 
to an account not defined within your zone of trust. So again, you know, if you've got hundreds of accounts in your organization, this is gonna be super, super important for managing third-party uh, access, right? We have a lot of customers who create IM roles to allow for you know, uh, services like Splunk to pull in logs, uh, common use case, right? So we wanna make sure that if we're using, we have SaaS providers that you know, we're, we're, we're creating IM roles to provide access to that SaaS provider that we're controlling that appropriately. So finally, our last engineering principle, uh, individual autonomy, other than in, uh, data minimization, this is probably my favorite one. When we talk about individual autonomy, like Carl said, we get into elements of data quality, right to erasure, right to rectification, right to access. Uh, you know, if a data subject is subject to um, automated decision making, there's a lot of privacy implications there as well. Um, again, these are all things we get into with customers on the daily. With, um, but like I said, we're just gonna cover a couple of things here. These are some of my highlights. Um, so the first one, and we talk about Glue Data Brew all the time with individual autonomy. A big part of respectful processing of customer information is to not just know what you're consuming, limit what you're consuming, but enforcing structure around what you're consuming. So a data catalog is going to be key. It forms the foundation for you to respond to right to access, right to erasure, to know, you know, orchestration in your pipelines. ETL is gonna be key, including for quality. So this is the one example I have here up on the screen. We're using Glue in conjunction with other AWS managed services to provide um, a quality improvement capability. So uh, in this example, I kind of have a step-by-step -step here. So we've got uh, we're pre uh, situation where we're per periodically sending raw data to an S3 bucket for storage. Um, we're occasionally reading that raw data in Amazon S3 and generating a scheduled data brew profile job to determine data quality. So there's a lot of pre-built, I think it's like 250 data quality rules within Glue Data Brew. So you may ask, you know, you may ask me, what do you mean by data quality, right? I'm talking about removing null values. I'm talking about fixing incorrect values with the last recorded quality correct value, right? There's all over 250 rules. If you're making all of these decisions that are privacy-based based on the data, you better hope that the data is of high quality. So we're reading that data using data brew, uh, a data brew profile job from S3. Um, we're writing that data brew profile job output to another S, uh, back to S3. We're triggering an Amazon event bridge event after that job completion. And then uh, we're invoking a Lambda function based on the event, which reads that profile output from S3 and determines whether uh, the output of that profile job meets predefined data quality rules. So your organization is gonna have to define what metrics around data quality, right? And so in this case, we're writing an AWS Lambda function that basically compares those data quality rules to the output of that Glue Data Brew profile job, and then eventually subscribes uh, to an SNS uh, uh, service, uh, topic and then pushes out the results of that comparison uh, in this case to an email notification. So, and as a part of this, Carl talked about a uh, people process superstructure, right? You need folks who are going to own data governance, right? You need a data custodian who can define and drive forward defining data quality rules. And another example I like a lot, and this kind of gets into when I was talking about right to access, right to rectification, right to deletion. Um, it's super important that if your data subject comes to you and says, I want all the data that you have on me, you provide that data, right? Again, pending your legal counsel. Uh, but you know what I see a lot from a lot of customers is we need to provide this data in a machine readable portable format. So what does that mean, right? You're not giving them uh, a, a, a format of data that requires a third party application that has a license, right? No PDFs, I'm talking JSON, uh, ASCII text, right, uh, Parquet, right? So you're gonna have to provide that data in a way that can be imported into other sources so you're not restricting the ability to use that data elsewhere. So in this example, which is relatively simple, again, it uses Glue. I talked about Glue Data Catalog. What I love about Glue is that it supports many different data stores, DynamoDB, RDS, S3, Redshift. And what you can do is, a, take Glue to scan all of those data sources, right? And you can create a 
glue metadata catalog, right? So in this case, step one, we got crawlers that are scan scanning those, all those different disparate data sources. It may be structured data, it might be semi-structured data, maybe even unstructured data. So we've got a crawler scanning those sources, it's populating a glue data catalog with a complete index of all the data subjects, PI that's found. Uh, that glue data catalog then will serve as a central metadata repository. Uh, and then the glue ETL will read and write that metadata to a glue data catalog, and it will load that normalized and portable data subject PI into the target S3 bucket, staging it um, in a normalized, flattened, readable, portable format uh, for the data subject, and it can be provided in step five through a uh, client application. And then finally, last but not least, uh, disclosure, I think this is last but not least, disclosure control. So like Carl said, we think about this a lot in terms of what you think of traditionally as security. The way I like to phrase it is preventing unintended disclosure of personal information. So we'll focus on uh, two key services. Carl talked about Amazon Code Guru. This is a developer tool, tool that provides intelligent recommendations uh, to improve not just code quality, that's a lot of what people think about code lengthening, right? Okay, I don't have defects in my code. Well, guess what? There's I don't know, uh, over a dozen, probably even more uh, 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 checks within CodeGuru around uh, data leakage, right? So it not only looks at your most expensive lines of code, but will look at your existing software development workflow, automate code reviews during application development, providing those uh, information leak leakage uh, recommendations uh, as you go along. So it's really great. It integrates with uh, a number of different repositories, I think, Obviously, AWS Code Commit, uh, GitLab, Bitbucket, GitHub. Um, and what's great about it is you turn it on and it actually provides inline recommendations as a part of your commits um, in the GUI. And it's all very nice and you can respond to them. And, um, you know, what I really meant, and I kind of have both Code Guru Reviewer as well as Profiler suction these off. Reviewer is kind of the pre deployment, right? And then Code Guru Profiler, all the rules and things that. We'll take a look at your application post-deployment runtime, right? So I really like to focus on a Amazon Code Guru Reviewer for now. And again, uses ML automated reason, reasoning to identify uh, those critical issues that I had mentioned within your code base. This is an example of a pre-built uh, of a rule that more specifically, again, as relevant to privacy, uh, will detect your sensitive information leak. So in this case, the code contains potential on a Intended disclosure of PI, uh, or more specifically, it looks like a uh, account ID, right? So it'll take a look at maybe where you might be exposing an AWS account ID, which is considered sensitive, or I think it should be considered sensitive. Um, and then you could, well, it will basically go in, recommend a fix within your, uh, your, your, uh, as a part of your commits, or as a result, as a response to your commits. And then finally, AWS Signer. So. I showed that ride sharing app earlier. Uh, we use a number of different lambdas. AWS Lambda is our serverless solution uh, where you can deploy Python code uh, or, or Java. I think it supports a number of different platform, uh, languages. But what, what's key, if you're going to use AWS Lambda to come in and support your consent management, right, privacy compliance, it's super, super important that you uh, limit the ability for an adversary to come in and piggyback on the uh, permissions that that AWS Lambda is granted, right? So if you're using AWS Lambda to make changes to personal information, like masking personal information, or if you're using an AWS Lambda to update your consent ledger to show you the latest status of, you know, what your user's opt-in, opt-out consent status is, that's gonna be a critical function, right? So you're gonna wanna make sure that you trust the code underlying those Lambda functions, and that's where AWS Signer comes in. So with AWS Signer, uh, you set up a signing profile, and basically you uh, enable within your Lambda functions the ability to only update code if that code has been signed via an AWS signing, signer signing profile. So it's kind of a two-step process where you turn that on within Lambda to only allow the updates to code with the signing, uh, with, with, with the cryptographic signature, and also you would take your IAM roles, right, your developers who are able to upload code to Lambda, want to make sure that only those specific developer roles have the ability to go into sign code in the first place. So this is kind of a layered approach to 
basically, again, present, preventing uh, adversaries from going in. You know, this is a common attack vector I see not just with Lambda, right? They'll go into a compromised EC2 instance. They'll go into a, a Lambda, right, where it's got a overprivileged or specifically privileged IAM role attached to it. That could be a problem. So we want to prevent that from happening. And with that, I will invite uh, my colleague Carl back up to the stage. All right. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. Um, we want to thank you for spending your afternoon with us. Uh, we know it's the last hour of Reinforce, so we really do appreciate you, you uh, spending it with us. Uh, we hope that you walked away with something that you can use in your organization today. Uh, and we also would uh, love to get your feedback on this session. We hope to present something similar at reInvent uh, in November. So please fill out the survey, give us honest feedback. We of course hope that we could get a five, but we're not gonna be asking you for that. We want your honest feedback so we can make this better. So thank you again. If you have any questions, we'll be around. So thank you and we hope you had a great time here at AWS Reinforce. Thank you.